79 years ago, hundreds of thousands of allied prisoners of war, many malnourished and weakened from long, in some cases even years, of captivity, were forced to walk hundreds of miles through snow, ice, and bitter cold. They were driven by their German captors fleeing the Russian army's advancement on the eastern front of Europe during the last winter of World War II. This year, on the anniversary of this incredible and deadly ordeal, 32 U.S. Army soldiers of the 3rd Infantry Division, attached reserve units, and Poland garrison recreated that long march from the POW Memorial in Zagan to Spremberg, Germany from January 26 to January 28. Because of the hellish conditions, an estimated thousands died from these prison evacuations. Most that survived did not find their freedom even as the Nazi defeat neared, but instead found themselves herded onto cattle trucks and train cars and shipped to other prison camps throughout inner Germany. On 27 January 1945, imprisoned Allied airmen of the Third Reich's notorious POW camp, Stalag Luft III, began their long march to Spremberg, Germany. They didn't know what fate awaited them as they stepped into the freezing darkness. Many feared they would be executed by their captors. I'd like to welcome you and first of all, thank you for being here to commemorate 79th anniversary of the evacuation of Stalag Lv 3. If you think about the soldiers being here, listening to the sounds of war, which was supposed to bring them freedom, to bring them liberty. But unfortunately, what was tragic in their moments that they were taken from this, this uh, place to the unknown. They were walking into the unknown. They didn't know whether they were going to be free or not. But the crave uh, for freedom was much stronger in many of them. And this is what you commemorate today. Thank you very much for being here. For three days, nearly 12,000 U.S. Army and Royal Air Force evacuees of Stalag Luft III marched 60 miles with inadequate clothing, many without boots, and only rag-bound feet, shuffling along frozen cobblestone roads. They suffered and died of numerous maladies, frostbite, hypothermia, disease, broken bones, or they succumbed to starvation, exposure, or exhaustion. Their resilience teaches all of us a lesson, particularly those at the craft of arms can learn a lot about what they stood for, what they fought for, and what they the lessons that they handed down to us, and you are marching exactly in their footsteps. You are the current holders of that very, very precious gift. And I hope you think about that during the march. You are marching in the footsteps of the greatest generation. And they are sitting on our shoulders and looking at what we're doing today and are very, very proud of us. More than two dozen of these reenactment marches have been conducted since 2003, mostly by British Royal Air Force members. But these are the first American military members to participate since the original torturous march in 1945. These soldiers were led by Captain Brandon Wayne, a logistics officer assigned to 87th Division Sustainment Support Battalion, 3rd Division Sustainment Brigade, and the training organized by Howard DeLester head of training for the organization that developed the arduous educational tour and his team. Wayne and the other 3rd Infantry Division soldiers deployed to Europe from Fort Stewart, Georgia months ago to engage in multinational training alongside U.S. allies to bolster security and deter aggression on the continent. On day one, their first objective is Ilova. Ten and a half miles from Stalag Luft III. There, they visit an elementary school named in honor of the Allied airmen that marched through the town eight decades ago. Uh, it's, a, it's an honor and privilege for the school to, to carry the name of the Allied airmen. So just short, just short uh, uh, trip of the school. We will enter. <laughs> We have a quote from Les Brown, an American. Aim at the moon, and even if you miss, you'll end up among the stars. 
No, to jest hasło naszej szkoły, to jest nasze motto. And this is the motto of the school. There are plaques, as you can see on the wall, Black over there. After a tour, a break, and some refreshments, the group heads to the Sacred Heart of Jesus Church, a few short blocks away, where a number of the prisoners slept, and a marker informs visitors so, in Polish and English. So I don't have to translate it to you. And also, they founded a glass stain, which is here on the right, 26th, and then 1978, when the plaque was funded and the... But again, the center compound, the, the American prisoners, they, they were right here. So... As the group nears the end of Ilova, Howard pulls them all into the parking lot of a transportation company building. It was originally the Nazi Haubau labor campsite, and Howard leads a frank discussion on the Holocaust and war crimes committed by the Nazis. This camp held over a thousand people that suffered indescribable torments, all forms of abuses, forced labor, and countless murders. There are hundreds and hundreds, thousands of these camps all over Eastern Europe where ordinary men and women were dragged out and suffered the appalling indignity of working here because of their race, because of their religion, and because of what they believe. And that is exactly what we are fighting against. And that's why we are here, and that's what it means, to prevent places like this from being established again. The march continues. Everybody behind us is highly motivated. No one's falling out yet. Everybody's getting to know one another. Everybody's coming from different places, so it's a lot of camaraderie going on. It's an honor to, just to be able to be the first ones to commemorate and put boots on the ground on the same exact route that they took. Uh, it's a very powerful message in what we're doing here, I believe. So far, we're looking at about uh, 13 miles so far, 21 and a half. Yeah, so we're over halfway, so what we're going to do is do a little bit of what we've already done. A steady but moderate rain soaks the marchers. The sky broods as the forested road curves and climbs upward. now beginning to show strain and weariness. The soldiers have walked nearly 18 miles. About two and a half, three miles left out, left, uh, left to get to the barn, uh, to the completion of day one. Um, still very, you know, highly motivated. It's, it's good to go, it's a good first day. Uh, prep for the night, you know, run through like a little bonfire tonight. Uh, and then uh, relax, refit, and get ready for day two. The group reaches Lipna. There, the barns in which hundreds of the Allied POWs sheltered their first night have long fallen apart. However, a small but growing fire greets them. Along with the landowner and his family, who asked they call him Baba. Baba and his spouse purchased the barns a few years ago and have managed to save two of the barn's roofs. Unfortunately, the third has already collapsed. Nonetheless, he says they are working to restore the site 
and turned it into a museum honoring the prisoners that sheltered amongst the cows 79 years ago. Uh, initially there are boards in there which they have done themselves uh, and the site is going to be restored and there is hopes and Vava will tell you, they'll both tell you about what they hope to do in the future here. So. Uh, expect that you are quite tired <laughs> after this uh, uh, 31 kilometers. Uh, he jokes that there will be no cows to warm them tonight. There is also no plumbing You're and no heat. A very, very long way in the footsteps of those heroes. And uh, I know it was tough for some of you. Uh, and it was just absolutely superb. You should be really proud of yourself for what you've achieved today. It's fantastic. What's up, buddy? Time. Hey, welcome home. Welcome home. Here's your, here's your bunk over there, okay? <laughs> um, just thinking about what they had to go through. So, just thinking about different stops, places where they were uh, living at, the conditions, and it's just remarkable how um, they were able to do that. So, if they can do it, then I can do it. That was what I was telling myself. Should be able to get some decent amount of sleep. I would say it's a lot better than what other people, um, especially the POWs, they had, so. But the barn keeps out the rain, and the group unloads, resting and performing foot care. Some soldiers already have blisters and separating skin from their soles after walking 21 and a half miles. Oh, there you go. That's a good one. They tape and bandage them and sleep as best they can in the chill <laughs> night air. Closing day one of the long march. Day two dawns cold and gray, but no longer raining. Slowly the soldiers rouse from deep within their sleeping bags. One starts the fire going again. Vavo and his family join them, chatting quietly as the group coalesces in the yard. Before heading out, Vavo shows them the dedication plaque that's been placed on the lead barn and he shares his family's ambition toward preserving the site to educate others of the heroic feats of the thousands of captive airmen that sought sanctuary from the brutal winter there. So it was the uh, 26th of uh, January, the, that was the beginning of the marches uh, 79 years ago. Next year it will be 80th uh, anniversary and uh, the American troops yesterday were sleeping in one of the barns uh, almost like uh, POWs did it. The difference was that today we have really beautiful weather comparing with that uh, from 79 years ago. It was minus 20 around and full of snow so it was very cold. Uh, this time it was much warmer, happily. Families of the marchers were visiting us, and uh, but they haven't been sleeping here, of course. You know, it's a great thing that we can cultivate the history. You know, it's a great thing that we can remember what was happening, that we are, we, we, we're not going to forget it. And uh, that it will be sort of a reminder how it could be. The night at the barns in 1945 was the coldest of the year by an account of the marchers. After a night most spent huddled in sleeping bags on the concrete floor with erratic sleep, the majority begin the second day of the march wearing their cold weather gear. now turns down the road heading toward Germany. Today's nearly entire 20-mile route runs alongside the current day German-Polish border. They will cross the international border today and then stop for the night at Bad Moskau.
seven miles and going on eight. Uh, about a 14 mile stretch that we're doing straight through. All the way across the border. Uh, about 16, 15 a day. We'll be crossing the border into Germany. We went through a town. Um, a, lot of, a lot of support from the people from there. But kids, people of all ages coming outside, uh, waving through the windows. Knowing that, knowing that we're here, knowing what the long march is. It's been commemorated every year. So uh, it's good to see. It's well, magic for them to see us for the first time. miles past, feet and legs already tender from yesterday's March protest as the smooth road becomes uneven cobblestone. Seventy-nine years ago, thousands of U.S. Army and Royal Air Force prisoners would have had to choose between walking on the icy cobblestone or on the snow packed by previous waves of marchers on the sides of the road for the entire route. and soon the terrain is rolling. For this group having completed three quarters of their day's march, the weariness and pain show to some degree in everyone. We just finished uh, the major leg of the uh, second day, so about five, six miles away from the end point. I'm making a good time. I think we're about maybe 30, 45 minutes ahead of schedule. Chocolate bars is quick energy replenishment supplied to us by the great folks who uh, coordinated this work march. Uh, Howard, Merrick, Simon, Helen, all of them have been doing a great job of taking care of us along the route, making sure that we get all the nourishment that we need. As the group rests, Howard shares more harrowing accounts experienced by the POWs. It was icy as hell on those roads. One of the Kriegers who did the march, he only came on the one occasion to Stalag of Free in 2008, and he told me that the guy next to him fell on the, and had broken his ankle on the ice, and he kept marching, and he got just before uh, Spremberg, and he fell again, he broke his other ankle. He tells of a British chaplain that comforted a dying American football player. Malnutrition, cold, snow. Just got Illustrating how a physically powerful athlete was susceptible as any to death in the horrific conditions. I stayed with him until he died. Closed his eyes and ran to catch up with the main column three miles away. This summons came again and again, but thankfully it wasn't the fine length. If you need to drop your rook, drop your rook. Nobody's gonna think different about you. No one's gonna think different about you. If we see you, you know, falling behind too heavily, even you know, even with the drop in pace, we're gonna tell you to drop your rug at that point, all right? Make sense? Any questions? It's impossible to really comprehend the horrors and inhumanity of this anniversary 79 years ago. Stiffened, frozen bodies laid on the ground along the route. One American medical officer described how the ever worsening conditions resulted in countless cases of trench foot frostbite, gangrene, amputations, dysentery, tuberculosis, and other diseases. These people who came here in 2009 from the United States, um, children of, the, of these POWs who walked exactly the same route, they came here in 2009 and to commemorate their fathers, they did the same. They did a walk from Jagan, from the museum to Spremberg. They were older people. Uh, 60 plus and of course they didn't march the whole route they, they did some parts but again they really walked the same path the same road as their fathers did in 1945 and some of these people they still had their, or their original fathers uh, overcoats or some parts of the uniforms cups you know and the t-shirts with the, with the portraits of their fathers, which was really something big. Our mission as a museum and, and duty to, to teach, to educate, especially younger generations, what war means, what POW means, and all this. I'm, I'm impressed. I'm, I'm really proud. And, 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 and really makes me really smile to, when I see people who are involved in this, they do this 
not because somebody told them to do this, but they just want to do this. Finally, the group crosses the Lusatian Nice, the river that serves as the modern day border. Very happy we made it this far. It's been a long, grueling day, but everybody is once again made it to the destination. It's about 200 meters out from our bed downside at the barns. Just very happy and motivated to be here. So far, 41 and a half miles down, 17 and a half to go for tomorrow. soldiers halt at horse stables that had served as shelter for the marchers. Today, the stables are modern and recently renovated. The heated building and running water is a welcome reprieve from the conditions of the last two days. You get the benefit of this. The first troops, Americans to be in here since the war. The soldiers now have the opportunity to walk to nearby restaurants for drinks. None go, and all of the exhausted troops are asleep by 9.30. They've walked nearly 21 miles again today. Tomorrow, they'll step off for the last leg of the long march. Frost covers everything, and bells call parishioners to Sunday Mass. Staff Sergeant Sabin Thapa, a medic, prepares feet for the last leg of the march. Every night and every morning, as others rest, Thapa has inspected and tended to others' feet. Can I get some more moleskin as well? More moleskin? Yeah. Uh, quite a bit. I'm gonna cover my some of my toes and stuff. <laughs> so he's participating in the march as well as being the uh, primary medic on the march as well. So in between stops, every night, every morning, he's double checking everybody's feet, and just overall wellness, issuing uh, uh, this medicine that he has. Oh, this one is strong though. Okay. And just taking care of everybody you know, from every, everywhere. He's just. He's Killing it every day, every morning, every night. You're not lying. Uh, last night we crossed uh, over the bridge into the border of Germany after trailing it for about five miles. Uh, yeah, so as soon as we crossed over, we uh, immediately into the country is the barn that we're staying in now uh, in Lechnica. Uh, but after that, you know, everybody came in, got settled in, uh, conducted some proper hygiene. You know, they uh, accommodated us with showers and everything, and then went out and got pizzas for everybody, you know, to uh, celebrate a successful day of marching. Uh, pretty grueling, but we made it through. Yeah, it's a sh short day, right? 17 miles short day. But uh, ready to get to it. Yeah, I knew, knew what signing up for this was. I knew what it meant. Uh, just for myself personally, you know, just uh, trying to 
get more uh, immersed in the history. So uh, you know, everybody's in it for the same reason. Everybody's the goal is for everybody to finish together. So it just looks my left, my right, my front, my rear. There's somebody there at all times. So if they're moving, I'm moving. Simple as that. Um, we're going to march off now to the final destination of Springberg as they did in World War Formed II. up outside, we will be at the, castle the soldiers the watch as Captain Wayne thanks the property owners and again bestows 3rd Infantry Division patches as tokens of appreciation, just as he has to others they've met throughout the march. Then they depart. The march will end at Spremberg Bonhoff the train station where the POWs were shipped out for imprisonment deep inside the core of the Third Reich. Gradually, the landscape changes again from fields to forests, villages to towns. Residents greet the passing soldiers with smiles and waves. Right now we're walking through the, uh, the town of Elbendorf, we just passed it through a uh, little pot, oh, slightly populated area, but yeah, we're about a third of the way through, a little over maybe. So people come outside, take pictures, wave at us, you know, honk the horns, you know, just in, in support of us being here. So it seems to be pretty warming. Everybody seems to be doing fine. Everybody's all together, no fallouts. You no, know, if you can hear, everybody's motivated. Uh, <laughs> It's a beautiful day outside, so not, not too much to complain about. What's remarkable about the last three days that the soldiers have been experiencing here is they are literally walking in the footsteps of those heroes from World War II. Every footstep they make forward, every place they put their head to sleep is where their forefathers, those who fought and secured our freedom in World War II, actually were. And what is most remarkable about this is this is the first time that United States soldiers have marched this route since World War II. And that is an extraordinary honor, mostly for all of us involved and especially for them. And we're sure that that greatest generation are looking down on this with huge amount of pride. One of the benefits of Exercise Long March is it shows soldiers young, longer serving, how all of this pieces together for what we do today. It gives a real reason and underpinning as to why uh, forces are here today and those enduring relationships that were formed at the end of World War II are still happening to this very day. As a military organisation, we are nothing if we don't have our heritage and we don't have our history. That is the foundation block of what we are here for. That's what we stand for. Those are the badges we wear. And that's the whole reason that we're doing this. It's really to reinforce that in these soldiers who have their everyday jobs and they're busy and we all lead busy lives but we have to keep remembering what underpins the reason people put a uniform on. This will be the 26th long march we've completed. As a historian, as a, uh, a, a military guy, I get the knowledge that we are keeping this story alive. It's very, very important for me. What we want to do, me and my team, the mill training team, is we, we want to keep this alive for the future because I firmly believe that this gives us such great lessons for all of us. It brings together people in an incredible way. The camaraderie, the togetherness of people who previously hadn't met. Along with us, you know, in a very quick period of time, we gel as a team. And that teamwork and that, that personal endurance, that resilience, all these things that we know are there, but we don't see every day. And when you bring people on this, I see that and I get an enormous amount of pleasure. And also because most of the veterans aren't alive anymore, uh, those that we did bring on this trip, I, I feel them sat on my shoulder watching what we're doing and I can hear their voices and I try and transmit their voices to the people on the march as well. And I'm always a bit deflated when I go back home. We're always going to be another one and we look forward to meeting the people on the next one. But if you're seeing US soldiers on this route, it's the first time and that for me is an incredibly special moment. I hope it's the first of many that they come on. Finally. 
As the sun slips low over the horizon, the group reaches Spremberg. They've walked nearly 18 miles today, a total of 60 miles over three days. Well, it's go time. We're almost with the last, last stretch. Yeah. Feeling good. Uh, just got back from the train station looking at it. We're looking, uh, looking mighty fine on time too. Uh, pace is good. Everybody's still here with us. So happy to be bringing it in. I can hear the motivation behind me. It's a culminating event for one of the hardest things, if not the hardest thing a lot of people in the formation have done up to this point in their careers. 60 miles is nothing to turn your nose up at, so yeah, just excited to get it done. Rock of the mark. Sadly, the World War II POWs that survived their three-day ordeal did not find liberty or relief at Spremberg Bonhoff. There, the POWs were loaded up and taken for detention throughout inner Germany. Many would not survive to experience liberation when the war ended. A large crowd has gathered to witness the soldiers' arrival at the train station built in the 1860s, and their long march concludes with the knowledge that they have completed the monumental task. And that is... Uh, all right, how are you doing? Ah! All right, cool, man, to the end, all 50 miles done. Absolutely astonishing achievement. Uh, you have followed exactly in their footsteps, as we've said many times before. And this is from the exact spot that the Allied prisoners of war went off to different locations, uh, many, many hundred miles away in the middle of Germany. The most terrible war that we had known in the 20th century had finally ended. And out of the ashes of that terrible war, that terrible conflict, came friendship. And friendship with our friends here in Spremberg, friendship with Germany, a great bond that exists between our nations, not only militarily, but socially in every other way. We started as enemies, we have been firm friends for many, many longer years, and that will continue. Congratulations from me on making this incredible march. It's a real credit to the United States, to the United States forces, and to yourselves. That night, the training team hosts a commemorative dinner for the soldiers at Castle Klitschko, just south of Zagon. The road-weary soldiers and their feet get a bus ride to the castle. I will never forget that I am American, fighting for freedom, responsible for my actions, dedicated to the principles which make my country free. Master Sergeant Kevin Bryant stands and recites the code of conduct for members of the armed forces of the United States. It's a powerful reminder of who they are and of what could be required of them in service to the nation. Captain Wade, thank you for corralling all this group of... More congratulations and words of appreciation for the team members follows a meal of traditional Polish fare and several courses. This is something that you guys can take home. You might not be able to explain it to your friends, but the people in this room, the people at this table, they'll completely understand exactly what you're talking about. So please just enjoy it, cherish it, because I know tomorrow a lot of us are going back to work. And never forget this, all right? Thank you guys for your time. The meal and the environment is a stark contrast from their experiences over the last three days. And it serves to recognize the soldiers for an extraordinary accomplishment. It also serves to promote a newly formed camaraderie that's developed through shared hardship. I'll say that they will never forget this experience or the lessons they've learned from the long march. <laughs>